My name is Ashira Ostrow. I am the executive director of the Breslin Center for Real Estate Studies at Hofstra Law School, and I am really delighted to welcome you to our program today, um, which will examine race and property in the law school curriculum. And I'm particularly excited um, that we have an incredibly extraordinary group of scholars with us who have really spent their lives researching, advocating, thinking about these issues um, as it relates to race, history, law, society, and more. Um, I wanted to just make a quick kind of announcement that one of our original panelists, Kesu Park, who's wonderful, um, was not able to join us today. And we are very, very thankful to Professor Bethany Berger, um, who, who stepped in and, and rounds out our, our wonderful panel today. Um, before I uh, kind of move on, I also want to um, encourage you to ask questions. We would like this program to be as interactive as possible. Possible. We want to address your concerns and your thoughts and hear your suggestions. So um, please feel free throughout the program to post questions or comments to the chat. Um, you can send them directly to me if you if you would like, but there is a slight chance that I might I might not see them. But you know, feel free. Um, so we'll try to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, okay, and so with that, um, I am honored to introduce uh, our keynote speaker for today, um, which is who is uh, Joseph Singer, the Busey Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. Professor Singer. Um, teaches and writes about property law, conflicts of law, and federal Indian law. And he also writes about legal theory uh, with an emphasis on moral and political philosophy. He has published more than 80 law review articles and dozens of books. And in fact, Professor Singer is, uh, was the very first person to write a property law casebook that expressly addressed issues of race in property law. And that case book has had a um, just dramatic impact, um, allowing other law professors to incorporate that material into their own classrooms and giving it, you know, giving it structure. Um, and so I, I'm really honored to um, turn the presentation over to Joe and um, hear his thoughts. Thank you, Ashira, um, and thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, when I was asked to do this talk on race and property law, um, my mind went to the concept of relativity of title. I'm not exactly sure why, but it did. I thought about this and I discovered why the phrase is relevant to the topic of property law and race. Relativity of title is a core principle of American property law. Real estate specialists know that some legal procedures can result in a determination that one person has clear title to property as against everyone in the world. That can happen in a state that has registered title like Massachusetts or in any state through a quiet title action. But the thing is most lawsuits are between two competing claimants to property. And those lawsuits do not end with the determination that one of the parties has clear title against everyone else in the world. The law privileges the rights of a current peaceful possessor of land. And the courts only dispossess that person if someone else can prove that they have a better title than the current possessor. That means that a peaceable possessor of land can win against a challenger, even if they don't own the land. You cannot dispossess someone just because they do not have legal title to the land. You have to show that you have a better title than they do. This principle surprised a lot of bank officials during the subprime crisis. When homeowners failed to pay their mortgages, the banks foreclosed on the ground that the owners had forfeited their rights to the land. But when millions of foreclosures happened all at once, the courts started asking the banks to prove that they had the right to foreclose. Rather than just assuming that the banks knew what they were doing and taking at face value the documents they presented to the courts, 
judges made the courts show a valid written source of title to the mortgage. Amazingly, many banks could not do this simple thing. The statute of frauds has been around for hundreds of years and transactions involving rights and land are generally required to be in writing. However, the banks had been unbelievably careless in documenting the mortgages that they pooled and securitized. That meant that many of the banks could not satisfy state property law requirements sufficient to show written title to the right to foreclose. The result was that some homeowners were protected from foreclosure, at least for a time, because the banks had arrogantly assumed that the rules of real estate law did not apply to them. What does this concept of relativity of title have to do with race and property law? The answer is that titles to land in the United States are in fact relative to race in the sense that the question of whether or not one has title or access to title is a function of one's race. At times race has limited access to title in an open and unashamed manner. At other times, access to property has been denied on account of race through seemingly neutral rules of law that nonetheless distribute rights and land in a manner that provides a path to ownership for some while denying it to others. Our legal system brazenly divested native inhabitants of their property rights in land. And it divested black Americans of their property in themselves and their own labor while denying both native and black persons the power to acquire title to land. If you dispossess a peaceable possessor, they have the right to get their land back if you do not have a better source of title. But that has not historically been true for native and black inhabitants of the United States. Again, dispossession ordinarily gives the dispossessed a right to get their property back, or at least a right to receive compensation for the loss but that right is relative to race. It has been granted to white people, but often denied to native or black people. And one can see similar problems that have historically limited the property rights of Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans. Property law vests title in the non-native inhabitants of land and in the descendants of slaveholders. While the courts have over time mostly failed to respect or protect the property rights of those who were dispossessed because of their race. One statute did try to make amends in the context of takings of tribal land. The 1946 Indian Claims Commission Act provided administrative compensatory remedies for tribes whose lands were taken with inadequate compensation. It is, of course, the case that no amount of money can compensate Indian nations for the loss of their ancestral lands. And fair market value is a poor measure of the harm that they suffered. That reparations law had its limitations, but $45 million in damages were paid to various Indian nations. And the existence of this law suggests that the failure to enact a similar law for the descendants of enslaved persons is based not on the impossibility of a reparations program, but on a lack of political will or a sense of urgency. Property in the United States has never been divorced from race. Native inhabitants had title to land, but that title was defined by American law to be vulnerable to seizure. It was not treated the same as the vested property rights, the fee simple enjoyed by white citizens. And that means that native title got far less protection than the fee simple of white citizens. Over time, the United States divested Indian nations of 98% of their lands. 
African Americans were not only the de denied the right to acquire property, but were deemed property themselves, then subjected to racial segregation, racially restrictive covenants, denial of access to low cost New Deal mortgages, denial of protection by minimum wage and labor laws, and exclusion from many towns because of exclusionary zoning. Asian inhabitants, inhabitants of the United States were historically denied the power to own land at all in Western states. And Japanese Americans were forced off their lands during World War II to be placed in American concentration camps, often losing their property entirely in that process. These facts are well known. They are glaringly obvious. And yet, when we think about property law in the United States, we have a tendency to push these issues aside, to treat them as if they are minor glosses on our property system. Or we think of them as facts concerning a matter that is distinct from our property system or property law. There, are, there is a tendency to think about the exclusion of people from the property system because of race as unfortunate facts about the distant past. We can note that these things happened, but that was then and this is now. The problem with this tendency to marginalize the issue is that the past is not past. Native Americans as a group are among the poorest people in the United States. It's true that some Indian nations are wealthy from casinos and other businesses. But many Native people in the United States live in conditions similar to less developed countries with no electricity, no water, no internet, no employment opportunities, and with high levels of crime and low levels of law enforcement. And Black Americans never fully emerged from the disabilities imposed on them by our legal system. At every era of United States history, the law has stacked the deck against African Americans. The middle class grew in part because of access to affordable housing in the New Deal era, but such funding was deliberately withheld from black families, while the practice of redlining made housing unavailable in areas reserved for white people. While formal discrimination in lending is now illegal, the lack of property accumulation by black families has led to a lack of wealth accumulation for them, along with unequal access to schooling, employment, and medical care. The past events are not that far in the past and their consequences are not in the past at all. The consequences are here today. And current laws, including property laws, have a disparate impact on different racial groups, even when they are neutral. Seemingly neutral laws like zoning and minimum wage laws help to maintain racial inequalities in access to income and wealth and land. Property is relative to race. Access to property without regard to race may be a goal, but we need to recognize that it has not been achieved. And one reason for that is property law itself. When I started teaching property law in 1984, I noticed that the case books did not mention the Civil Rights Act of 1964, even though it had been in effect for 20 years. While that law regulates employment discrimination, it also prohibits racial discrimination in a short list of public accommodations. It requires people to be allowed to enter hotels, restaurants, places of entertainment, and to demand full and equal enjoyment of the goods and services offered to the public. The public accommodations law is a limit on the right to exclude. Why was it not in the property textbooks in the section on trespass law when I started teaching. I found that peculiar 
since I had lived through the passage of that act, I remember it and I saw it as a milestone in the law and a major accomplishment in ending legalized mandated segregation by race in public accommodations. All property books include the topic of trespass and the right to exclude others. The right to exclude has always been recognized as one of the core property rights that owners have. Supreme Court cases recognize the centrality of the right to exclude when they address issues of regulatory takings. The fact that the right to exclude was improperly taken was key to the holding of several important Supreme Court cases, including, including the Cosby case of 1946, Kaiser Edna 1979, and the Cedar Point Nursery case decided just last year in 2021. The right to exclude is a central principle in the theories of some contemporary property law theorists like Henry Smith and Tom Merrill. At the same time, the right to exclude has always had limits. Trespass doctrine has exceptions. It was apparent to me that the new public accommodations law of 1964 was a hugely important limit on the right to exclude. It is not lawful to exclude someone from your restaurant on the basis of race. Customers have the right to enter and to receive full and equal enjoyment of the goods and services without regard to their race. Your reasons for not wanting to serve these customers are irrelevant, even if they're based on your, your religious commitments. There simply is no right to exclude people from a public accommodation on account of their race. But the 1964 public accommodation statute appeared nowhere in any property law casebook when I started teaching property law in 1984. When I asked my colleagues about this, they said, well, that's not property law. First of all, it's a statute, not common law. And it's a civil rights law, not a property law. And if anything, it limits property rights. It doesn't define them or protect them. I asked, well, when would, certain, when would students learn about public accommodations law? The answer was, well, they can take upper level courses, courses in any discrimination law. But when I inquired, I, find, I found out that only about 5% of the students took an upper level course in civil rights law since it was not required. And that course did not even cover public accommodations law. It only covered employment discrimination. So when would students learn that the right to exclude does not extend to racially motivated exclusion from public accommodations? The answer was that they would never learn about this, at least not from their professors while at their time in law school. I found this situation to be preposterous. Defining the issue as not part of property law seemed wholly arbitrary. Leaving it out of the syllabus suggested it was of minor importance. But I was born in 1954, just one week after the decision in Brown versus Board of Education was announced. I remember racial segregation. The 1964 act was passed when I was 10 years old. This is not part of medieval history. That act was not a small thing. It was a social and legal revolution in the rights of black Americans. Treating it as outside the topic of property law failed to recognize its importance. And that meant that the legal rules we were teaching were both incomplete and misleading. So I decided to teach Title II of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in my property class. And when I did that, I learned something I would not have otherwise understood. We have full rights to exclude in private property like our homes, with only a few exceptions. We are even legally free to exclude people from our dinner parties on the basis of race or religion or sex, if we want to do so. But that exclusionary right does not extend to businesses that, open, that offer their services to the general public. That means that property rights differ 
depending on social context. In the home, privacy and associational freedom norms prevail over equality norms. But in hotels and restaurants and places of entertainment, the opposite is the case. And because of recent interpretations of the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and state statutes in 45 states, the right to service without regard to race applies to all places open to the public, including retail stores, lawyers and doctor's offices and universities. Equal rights of access to the marketplace are the rule in the United States. And the right to exclude is limited so as to be compatible with the norm of equal access to the marketplace without regard to race. If you study public accommodations law in depth, you learn that the federal statute in 1964 defined public accommodations as including only a short list of places. It included hotels, places of entertainment, gas stations, and restaurants. That law does not extend to retail stores. And federal courts have interpreted the Civil Rights Act of 1866 to prohibit racial exclusion from retail stores. But most federal courts do not think that law provides equal access in the sense of full and equal enjoyment. That means that it is an appalling fact that there may be no current federal law protecting black customers from being followed around, called names, treated discourteously, prevented from trying on clothes, wrongfully accused of shoplifting, all because of their race. 45 states have laws that provide people rights in those situations, but five states do not. And one of those five actively empowers retail stores to deny service on account of race. If you're wondering, that state is Mississippi. Equal access to the marketplace without regard to race would seem to be a fundamental principle of the law in 2022. But the laws enforced do not fully reflect this norm. And it is not as if the phenomenon of shopping while black is not a pervasive current social and legal issue. It is my contention that you cannot understand our property law system without understanding the laws that both empower people to have access to the marketplace for goods and services without regard to race, while also understanding the limitations of those laws and the ways that they fail to achieve their legitimate and important purposes. On the housing front, we have historically excluded Black people from an easy path to homeownership. Those who were released from slavery after the Civil War were never given land of their own. They were never granted reparations for hundreds of years of stolen labor that was taken without compensation. Nor were they free to acquire property during the Progressive Era when local zoning laws denied people the power to buy property in white areas of town. Nor did they benefit from the benefit from New Deal's home ownership programs, where they were subjected to racially restrictive covenants and redlined, redlined out of access to low cost mortgages. Nor did minimum wage laws apply to agricultural or home service workers. And when non-racial zoning replaced racial zoning, unequal access to wealth meant that towns had the power to pass facially neutral laws that had enormous exclusionary and racially segregative effects. And all of this happened while the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause required proof of discriminatory intent on the part of public officials, while adopting evidentiary rules that make it almost impossible to prove intentional discrimination. So, if we focus for a moment on the topics often covered in an introductory property law course, we can see that many of those topics cannot be completely understood unless we pay attention to race. One topic that I've been talking about 
up till now is the right to exclude. Trespass law protects the right of owners to exclude others from their land. As we've seen, that topic cannot be fully understood or accurately understood without studying the Jim Crow laws that mandated racial segregation in public accommodations in many states. And without studying the public accommodation laws that combat racial exclusion in public accommodations that, that do not fully achieve their goals. As I have said, the phenomenon of shopping while black is a current problem. Um, just talk to anyone who has faced this. There are articles quite often in newspapers about this issue. And all of my friends um, uh, have stories to tell me about experiencing this. Um, but the law does provide a legal hook for many people in at least some cases. A 2020 case from the West Virginia Supreme Court, for example, awarded a total of $1 million in damages, in compensatory damages, not punitive, compensatory damages to two pipeline workers who were, den who were denied full and equal enjoyment of the services of a hotel. Um, so a second topic, in addition to right to exclude, is the owner's immunity from being dispossessed by having your property seized and taken away by others. Owners generally have the right to keep their property and they have no duty to sell it or give it to others. Owners are immune from forced seizures of their property unless it's taken for public use with just compensation. The nation had a very negative reaction to the Supreme Court's Kelo decision that allowed the city of New London to take the house of Suzette Kilo to be transferred for use to another private owner that the city hoped would promote local economic development. There was outrage over that case, but few people remembered that the title to all land in the United States is based on exactly such a grand redistribution scheme. Property was taken from Indian nations for transfer to non-Indians because the United States thought the tribes had more land than they needed and that white people could use the land better. The rights that many people championed for Su Suzette Kilo in the city of New London were systematically denied to Indian peoples. Those who were outraged by the taking of Kilo's house showed no awareness that their own lands were obtained by exactly the same kind of seizure from native nations. Property rights, as I have said, are relative to race. A third topic of the property law course is the freedom owners have to use and to develop their own property. A limit on the right to use and develop is nuisance law. Owners have no right to use their property in ways that substantially and, and unreasonably interfere with the use and enjoyment of neighboring property. But professors Tajania Henderson and Jamila Jefferson Jones published an amazing article in 2020 outlining dozens of cases that were brought against black landowners over the course of US history claiming that those owners were committing a nuisance, not because of the way they were using land, but just because their land was being used by black people. Most of these claims lost, but that did not stop people from bringing these cases. They did so because they thought they should and would win. They claimed that their property rights were injured by noise coming from singing in a black church or jazz club, or laughter in a skating rink, claims they never would have made if the owners had been white. It is not fun or easy or cheap to be a defendant in a civil lawsuit. Even if the defendant wins a lawsuit, the fact that it was brought imposes hardship and may discourage you from locating in a white neighborhood. And that was precisely the point of these nuisance cases. 
One case even claimed that an apartment building was a nuisance solely because it was inhabited by black people. A fourth topic of property law course is the right to transfer property and to enter agreements or covenants that divide up property rights among a group of people, which may include nearby owners. That power has historically limited, uh, has been historically limited to prevent the reemergence of feudalism. But it has also been historically limited by and relative to race. Consider the huge role that racially restrictive covenants uh, played in the post-war era. Um, and the case of Shelley versus Kramer, if we consider those things, um, uh, in Shelley, for example, um, one thing to think about is whether the covenant in that case, which said that uh, uh, no black people could live on a particular block, would that covenant have been enforceable under traditional property law? When we analyze that case in that way, we see that the answer may be no. There was no privity of a state in Shelley and the covenant did not touch and concern the land. So the enforceability of racial covenants needs to be analyzed, not just from the standpoint of modern civil rights law, but from the standpoint of traditional and modern equitable servitudes and racial and, and real covenants law. Regarding land transactions, consider also the denial of low cost mortgages um, to black families during the New Deal era, or the discrimination in the rental and housing markets that has only been partially alleviated by the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Consider the exclusionary zoning that prevents the construction of affordable housing with consequent racially segregative effects. Consider the statutes that prohibited Asian Americans from owning property in Western states and the internment of Japanese Americans. And students should understand that the special estate in land that defines the property rights that Indian tribes own, that property right is associated with powers of tribal sovereignty and it differentiates Indian title from the states and land held by non-Indians. A course that teaches the estate's system and future interests, but fails to mention tribal title has unwittingly misled students by omitting a form of land title that has origins in racially discriminatory treatment of American Indians and a form of land title that is the source of all the land titles for the rest of us. So that means that all the basic topics in a property law class are relative to race. The right to exclude, immunity from forced seizure, the right to use your own land, and the power to transfer property or make covenants regulating its current or future use. Racial issues have never been separate from property law. If you look for it, you will see it. And the past injustices about which I have spoken are not past. They have consequences today. The distribution of wealth and income differs by race. And the ability to move a family circumstance from one of poverty to wealth is harder now than it was in the post-World War II era. The racial disparities we see in access to property come partly from historical discrimination <clears throat> but they are also the result of our current legal system which perpetuates these injustices today i do want to include conclude on a hopeful note Current law supports tribal sovereignty and the development of tribal businesses and the appropriate development of tribal land for the tribes themselves. <clears throat> Current law does prohibit racial discrimination in public accommodations, employment, and housing. The legal system have pro has proved to be a powerful engine that can be used to promote racial justice. 
but we also have to recognize that it has been used and is still being used to promote injustice. My own view is that, we, is that we probably do better to think about reparations in a forward looking manner. If we focus on the facts of unequal distribution of wealth between white families and black or Latina or native families, we could turn our attention to identifying the rules of law that created and are perpetuating these inequalities. Inequality is not a fact of nature. It was deliberately created by construction of a property law system that makes access to property relative to race. Property law is something we made. And the good news is that it is something we can change. We can embrace property law by figuring out what rules are responsible for the continued racial disparities we have. Then we can determine what changes would reverse those inequalities and alleviate those injustices. We can start by adopting a basic norm. We must make it realistically possible for people to take care of themselves and their children and their elderly and disabled relatives. We must make it realistically possible to find employment that pays a living wage, a real living wage, one that is high enough to pay for necessities, comforts, and the dignities of life. We must make sure that people that are taking care of others have access to the resources they need to do that. We can remove laws that prohibit the construction of affordable housing, and we can ensure universal and equal access to the marketplace. Racial inequality persists because we allow it to persist. And we do that by the ways we have shaped our property law system. Property law works for some people, but not others. We can change the racial relativity of title by actively looking for the rules that perpetuate those inequalities. And we can reform those rules to make the system open to all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Singer. That was really inspiring. Um, uh, yeah, I see applause, and I, 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 uh, I would reiterate that. Um, so I, I received a few emails or a few chats. Um, there were some that were posted in general, and then I had a few um, on my own. Um, and um, let me see if I can summarize a, uh, a few of them that hit on similar issues. And so one of the themes was about reparations. Um, and so one student asked about um, how do we deal with even considering reparations when for many indigenous cultures, the land itself is, it, it, it doesn't have a monetary value. It has much more than that. And so the only real reparation would be to return the land um, is, is you know, how, how would that work or what are your thoughts on that? And um, another question that I got was, uh, you know, um, we are dealing with, you know, a, a centuries of, of housing and land use policies that um, have promoted um, segregation and, and economic inequality. Um, and one of the things you mentioned was about, you know, mortgage assistance. Uh, so a student mentioned that the Biden administration has been talking about um, down payment assistance uh, to help correct the injustices against um, the people that were discriminated against. Um, and, and so kind of what are your thoughts on that and, you know, any other reparation proposals that you've heard of? So yeah, thank you. Those are great um, questions. Um, on the on the native issue, um, it's quite right that there. You know, we sometimes talk in some of our classes, especially contracts and towards. Sometimes we talk about making people whole, and that maybe sometimes makes some kind of sense in contracts. If money's at stake, you can give people money so they're as well off, you know, as they would have been. But even there, if you breach a contract, people don't want 
to have a breach and a lawsuit and money. They actually wanted you to do what you promised to do. Um, and in the tort area, money, getting money from being assaulted or discriminated against doesn't make you whole. The, the language of being made whole is just inaccurate. Um, uh, and obviously it's true that um, just giving money to Indian nations does nothing to sort of, um, uh, sort of make people whole or sort of undo the damage. Um, uh, I do want to emphasize again that um, most people are just not aware of the Indian Claims Commission Act. There's a lot of ways to criticize it, but people that want to talk about reputations should at least know that actually there is at least one point in US history where reparations were actually granted. This was an act of Congress and millions of dollars were uh, paid out. Um, the, the valuation was not adequate. There were many people who were not allowed to get money. There was no interest paid. Uh, you know, there were a lot of different um, limitations on that law, but it is important to realize that the United States has at least once in this history actually paid reparations. Um, from the standpoint of Indian nations, um, again, I sort of am forward looking, which is to look at what are current problems um, and what are current um, goals, desires, um, longings of Indian people and Indian um, uh, tribal governments, right? And what tribal governments want is to have their sovereignty protected. What they want is to have their treaty rights protected. Uh, what they want is to have their continuing relationship with the United States to be done under um, principles um, of justice, which include tribal understandings of justice. Um, and most tribal understandings are that there's a continuing relationship and that payments by the United States are not gifts. Uh, the United States is making mortgage payments to Indian nations. These are amounts of money that are uh, not sort of just nice things, but that are owed by the United States uh, to Indian nations. So in the context of tribes, I think um, actually talking to Indian nations and figuring out what their goals are um, and how the United States can um, uh, have better relationships with Indian nations and help them to uh, protect and exercise their sovereignty. That's the best way to engage in uh, reparations. Money may be part of that. Um, as I said, the money payments that are made to tribes and money payments that should be made to tribes, I think of as things that are owed to the tribes, not just um, gifts or reparations. They are, it is money that the tr that tribes actually own, not you know some payment compensation for a tort. Um, on the mortgage assistance um, thing, there are many, many, many things that could be done and mortgage assistance uh, is a really good idea. I saw one worry, which is that many black families actually purchased property through the subprime loans and a lot of them lost it. And so um, uh, how do we make sure that when people buy property, uh, we're actually helping them rather than hurting them? Because if you bought property with a subprime mortgage and then you lost it through foreclosure, you're arguably financially worse off than you would have been if you had just rented and not bought property to begin with. So it is true that any uh, proposal for promoting home ownership has to be very attentive to making uh, mortgage payments fit people's incomes, uh, which is something that did not happen in the subprime crisis. Um, and we actually want people to um, get property which actually uh, will be long-term uh, something that uh, uh, becomes part of their wealth and part of their family um, history. Um, so I do think that, that actually um, helping first-time uh, homeowners and not just first-time homeowners, helping people become homeowners is a good thing. I also think that um, a lot of people like renting. There's no reason to force people to become a homeowner if they want to rent. We actually need better regulation of landlords. We need better regulation to make sure that the conditions of rented property are not horrible, 
a lot of low income families uh, are renting property that is in horrible conditions. Um, and part of that is because their landlords are also poor. Their landlords don't have enough money to fix the housing up. So I think we need another program of actually fixing rental housing for low income landlords and tenants. Um, and my idea is that we start from the goal. The goal is that everyone should be okay. Everyone should have access to property. There are different ways to get property, renting, uh, buying, getting a condominium, um, uh, co-ops. There are different forms of ownership. Um, and we want different forms to be available for people. Um, and we want to figure out ways that actually will achieve those goals. And I don't think there's one size fits all. We want to make sure that the reforms that we adopt and the programs we adopt are geared actually to helping people and get experts to help us figure out which of those things are actually going to work well to achieve their purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I have I have other questions that I could ask um, you, but I'm thinking maybe I'm going to introduce the other panelists and then we can open it up to a, um, a broader discussion. And so thank you so, so very much for um, starting us off with, with those remarks. Um, and so now if I could, um, I would like to introduce our panelists and our first panelist who, as I mentioned, um, is an expert in this area and was available and willing to fill in um, with very short notice. And we're very grateful to Professor Bethany Berger. Uh, Bethany Berger is the Wallace Stevens Professor of Law at the University of Connecticut. Um, and she is an expert in American India law, tribal justice, property, and conflicts of laws. Um, she is a co-author and executive editor of Cohn's Handbook of Federal Indian Law, which is the foundational treatise in the field. And she is also a co-author on Professor Singer's um, very well known case book on uh, property law. And so I'm going to um, very happily turn it over to Bethany for her remarks. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and uh, thank you to Joe for those wonderful remarks and thank you to all everybody in the audience um, for attending. So Joe focused on laws that are often specifically about racial inequality or racial equality. I'm going to focus on ways that race shape the basic property doctrines that we all live under, that you're studying in your 1L classes, and how we are all poorer for it. But before I do that, let me first situate myself. I'm speaking to you from Hartford, Connecticut, where I both live and work. Four centuries ago, this land and all the land in Connecticut was Algonquian land, or land of the Wangunk, Podunk, Tonksis, Mohegan, uh, Pequot, and Niantic peoples. Today, indigenous peoples have been dispossessed of all but a few 800 acres in that, of that land. And we could tell this story across the United States. Um, Many of you are probably listening from Long Island. If you think about Pearson v. Post, that unpossessed and waste land that Post and Pearson chased the fox over, that was Shinnecock land. That was Shinnecock common lands. Um, also, 100 years ago, Hart newspapers proclaimed Hartford the richest city in the United States. We had the finest schools in the state. We had parks. We still have these amazing parks and folks from outside the city flock to get into them. Today, Hartford appears more frequently as a symbol of urban decline in the newspapers, although it's awesome, you should all move here. Um, but the, and it's actually a crime for urban parents to send their kids to school outside of um, the city. Both of these transformations are deeply related to changes in property law that were very significantly about dispossessing, excluding, or dominating particular racialized groups. And I'm gonna discuss just three, transformation of foreclosure and lending, transformation of zoning, 
and trespass. First, white settlers transformed foreclosure and recording law to make it easier to dispossess Indians and finance slave expansion. In England, there was no public title recording um, and it was very difficult to foreclose on land at all and impossible to do it for debts that were not specifically um, on the land. But the colonies quickly adopted title registration and allowed foreclosure in a much broader um, set of circumstances. They did this for three reasons. First, to keep track of their rapid and often dubious claims to have acquired indigenous land. Second, to dispossess indigenous peoples for claim debts for goods um, and sometimes um, claimed hostilities. Third, to obtain financing from overseas financed on the backs of enslaved black people um, to expand plantation slavery. Just a side point, we call the horrible form of slavery that the United States initiated chattel slavery. Enslaved people were first declared chattel because that made them personal property and easier to foreclose on than if they'd been declared real property. So by elevating written claims um, to land and property over the on the ground memory and understanding of transactions, this allowed whites to take land by what indigenous leaders call, often called pen and ink witchcraft. Those who lose their homes to foreclosure today and find themselves caught up in bureaucracy and red, red tape not allowing them to negotiate their loans, even understand what's going on, will probably sympathize with that pen and ink witchcraft. Second, the birth of single family zoning. Um, it built on federal recommendations um, and reports calling such homes expressions of racial longing and advising that they should be completely separated from duplexes, apartment buildings, fourplexes, um, because those can underlive the one family home um, and drive it out, just as oriental labor can underlive and drive out white labor. It was embraced by northern cities, um, wanting to restrict both racially dubious immigrant groups like Italians and Portuguese and Eastern European Jews. And second, um, the dispersal of Southern Blacks moving to um, cities from the South. Um, and it's been embraced today and economists look at single family zoning as a major reason for the fight, the, for the affordable housing crisis we suffer under today. Third, the right to enter. At the founding of the United States, anyone could walk across unfenced land, graze livestock, forage, and even hunt um, as so long as the land was unfenced. Southern states started closing and ending the right to roam in 1865 and 1866, specifically so that free Blacks would not be able to support themselves and would have to work for the plantation owners. Today, Operation Lone Star in Texas is re-weaponizing the right trespass laws by getting rural um, landowners to sign what are called letters of trespass or trespass affidavits so that they can police and, um, and arrest mostly Latina migrants simply for walking across the land. Um, I'm running out of time, um, so I'm just gonna close there, but in every way, all of the doctrines that you are learning in your property class, almost all have been shaped significantly by our racial relationships and they've made the law less distributive, less responsive to on the ground justice, um, and undermined the income mobility, 
and the equal opportunity that was once the pride of the United States. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, for those of us that are teaching property right now, all of that uh, really does hit home. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm next very excited to turn it over to Professor Kaylee Murray. Uh, Kaylee is, or Professor Murray is a professor at Marquette University Law School. She is an expert in patent law, property law, and administrative law, and uh, she's very focused on the uh, impact of race and ethnicity and culture on the development of property law. She is the co-author of um, Integrating Spaces, which is uh, Cases and Materials on Race and Property Law, um, and is now uh, co-authoring the second of addition of that with Professor um, Villazor, who is next on our, on our panel. Um, and so it is really my pleasure to turn it over to uh, Professor Murray. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. So I was asked to speak about um, the relationship of race to intellectual property law, right? And as you're learning in your first year classes, intellectual property law is distinct from um, property law because intellectual property law manages um, relationships and in intangible property. And so we have to begin to think about the ways in which race has impacted um, this set of materials. I like when I speak on the subject of race and IP to focus students on two sort of different ways to address and think about race and race in the law. The first is what I call the racial subject, right, in, 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 in the law. And when we talk about the racial subject in the law, we're talking about the ways in which um, uh, uh, we talk about race and understanding the decision making of courts, legislatures, and legal agents, such as lawyers, legislatures, and social movements. So we, in when we talk about the racial subject of the law, are focused very much on what we commonly understand to be legal, right, thinking, um, and legal uh, articulations of that thinking through things like statutes, treaties, and constitutions. I also think, however, when you talk about and study race in the law, you have to think a lot about racial agency in the law. That is the ways in which um, individuals of diverse social identities uh, experience, encounter, and theorize about the law. And in there, we're looking at the intellectual autonomy of um, individuals of diverse social identities and how they encounter the law in everyday life. So they're, they're distinct approaches, right? When you're looking at racial subject, you're looking at what we consider to be traditional primary sources within the law. When we're thinking about racial agency, we might have to cast our net wider, right, to understand the impact of race and the law. So what does that look like in a sort of functional practice? When we look at the racial subject of the law, there are many different methods, right, for understanding understanding the racial subject in the law. We're going to talk today about critical race theory, but there are other types of theories on race, social and legal constructions of race, and in IP, right, there is a great um, set of um, theories and methods around the intellectual property social justice theory, right? And um, this is articulated by Latif Matima at um, Howard Law School. And when we talk about intellectual property and social justice, Latif says, we recognize that social justice is an inherent and an essential obligation of the IP regime. IP social justice theory treats intellectual property protection as a social ordering mechanism through which society progresses by nurturing um, beneficial intellectual activity. And so when we think about an IP and social justice theory, we may encounter race by thinking about the inequities of the intellectual property system. The example I often give is performance rights and copyright. Well, in copyright law, you may receive rights for writing a song, but in, a, in the law of the United States, we do not necessarily protect the performance of the song. And the example I always give, and that is most commonly understood by most Americans, is the song, I Will Always Love You, right? We have Dolly Parton writing the song, and for that, we receive copyright protection, but we do not grant Whitney Houston, right, protection in her performance, right? And this is a choice other, other IP systems actually do protect performance rights. Now, why are we treating different types of creativity differently? We know Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You as an iconic version, right, of that song, but yet she receives no intellectual property protection for that right. And so we then have to begin to think through, right, why Whitney Houston, 
does not receive protection for that intellectual property right. We have to think about the way in racialized ways in which performance rights in the United States have been constructed over time to exclude performers of color um, from um, this song. So that's one way of thinking about the racial subject in the law. And I know Ashira has this addressing critical race theory in another question, so I'll hold off on that discussion there. But then I'm going to turn to the question of racial agency in the law. That is, how do people of different diverse social identities think themselves of the production of law? And the example I like to give is that we want to make sure that we acknowledge and are respectful of the intellectual autonomy of individuals in the creation of law and thinking about law. So like, what does that mean? The example I like to give is of W.E.D. Du Bois. I mean, a towering racial um, uh, theorist and intellectual thinker. And it turns out W.E. Du Bois cared a lot about patents, right? And the ways in which uh, patents demonstrated the ability of African-Americans to become citizens. Um, in the 1898 um, Paris exhibit, W.E. Du Bois talked about uh, uh, patents and its relationship to um, the ability of black citizens to be creators. Now, Du Bois is not a lawyer, but he's talking about patent law. And he's thinking about the ways in which patent law can be about citizenship and about, again, the ability of African Americans to be democratic property owners. That that I learned from Joe, but uh, also thinking and, and applied in IP, but I think those are the things that you have to think about when you think about racial agency. Other people besides you think about law. And there are the ways in which they think about law can offer us really interesting ways to confront the questions that we see in the law itself. Another example I like to give is Octavia Butler, right? In her work in Kindred, right? In the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents and the ways in which reproduction is racialized in black women's bodies. Now, she's not a lawyer, right? She's not thinking about that set of issues as law, but her sort of theories about body, right? And ownership of body and who owns both the ownership of the property in the body, but also the type of IP rights that derive out of the body, um, I think has played an enormously important role in helping us to think through law. Right, and the ways in which law functions in a broader society. So I, I, I encourage you as you think about this set of questions in your first year and beyond to be careful um, from the standpoint of methodology to be asking yourself, am I talking about the racial subject in the law or am I talking about the racial age in the law? There are different methods for studying both and that we have to do a better job, I think, of thinking about the set of relationships going forward. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Ashir and uh, right back okay. to you. Thank you for that. And thank you also for setting us up for our uh, upcoming discussion or at least distinguishing critical race theory from some of the other um, theories and modes of study that, that we'll, we're gonna talk about. Um, and so uh, before we do get to any of that discussion, I am delighted to turn it over to uh, my former colleague at Hofstra Law School. Uh, Rose Cuzan Villazor. Uh, uh, professor Villazor is now the um, interim dean and professor, professor of law and chancellor's social justice scholar at Rutgers Law School. Um, and she teaches and writes in the areas of immigration and citizenship law, property law, critical race theory, um, Asian Americans in the law, and equal protection. And she too is the author of many, many articles and books, including the um, integrating spaces that it will be coming out with uh, Professor Murray, um, as well as a uh, book on immigration and refugee law, and a case book, uh, which is called Race and Races, Cases and Resources for a Diverse America, which is uh, forthcoming in, in 2022, or this year, I should say. Um, and so with that, I, I would love to turn it over to Professor Villazor. Thank you so much, uh, Ashira. And um, thank you to everyone for being here today. It is great to be back virtually at Hofstra Law School, where, as Professor Astrow noted, I was on the faculty between 2009 and 2012. Like others here, I teach property law. I also teach upper level courses, as Professor Astrow noted, um, including immigration law, critical race theory, Asian Pacific Americans and the law, and law and inequality. I wholeheartedly agree with everyone here that race and racism have shaped property law in various ways, 
or as Joe said in his keynote, Professor Singer said in his keynote, property has never been divorced from race. In my own work, I have sought to contribute to the body of work of race and property that others here have written about. And I've done so by exploring race related issues in property law that fall outside of the white over black paradigm and white over American Indian paradigm. What do I mean by that? Of course, in property law, it is central to examine the ways that anti-Blackness and anti-American Indian and laws of sovereignty have played in the exclusion of land ownership and access to property in American law. But in my own work, I have sought to complicate that further by also talking about the ways in which other non-Black people of color have been excluded from property law and also looked at the ways that laws have been designed to help non-American Indian indigenous peoples from being able to retain their lands. And so with my time here, I want to focus on two key examples. One is on anti-alien land laws that were passed against Japanese Americans that Joe mentioned in his keynote earlier. And second is what I refer to as blood quantum land laws that privilege Hawaiians, American Samoans, and people of the Northern Mariana Islands. Let me start with anti-alien land laws. In the 1920s, California and other Western states passed laws that prohibited the ability of non-citizens who were not eligible to become US citizens from owning, from owning land. These uh, laws were specifically designed to deny Japanese immigrants who were not eligible to become US citizens from purchasing property. So on their face, the laws do not seem to be racially restrictive. After all, the words of the statute provide that land ownership is denied to non-citizens. But if one were to look at the relationship between citizenship and race, one would see that at that time in the 1920s, only those who were white immigrants of, or immigrants of African descent were actually eligible to become US citizens. And so California and other Western, Western states knew this and relied on citizenship and immigration status as the basis for denying land ownership to those who are not eligible to become US citizens. And therefore they were racially excluded from owning property. The Supreme Court had the opportunity to review this one of the uh, these cases or one of these laws in the case of Oyama versus California in 1948. And there the court said that these laws did violate equal protection laws, as well as deny the ability of American citizens to own property. But the court left intact and valid the denial of, of land ownership to those who were non-citizens. So in other words, the court was protective of Japanese Americans who were born in the United States and were eligible to become US citizens, but allowed the ongoing discrimination of Japanese immigrants who were racially not eligible for citizenship. So through the Oyama case and these alien land laws, we see a much more complex and deep understanding of how race intersected with um, immigration and citizenship law in shaping land ownership in the United States. A second example of how I thought about race and racism in property law is the ways in which some jurisdictions have passed laws in order to protect indigenous peoples from losing their land. And an example I've talked about are what I, what I call blood quantum land laws. And here, one example I'd like to point out are land laws, blood quantum land laws that were passed in American Samoa, who, uh, which provided that persons in order to own land, in American Samoa, one has to be, one has to have 50% American Samoan blood. From our perspective in the United States, looking at this law, one can see that a law that privileges a certain racial group and even the invocation of blood, blood quantum, raises some concerns, understandably so. But if we situate this blood quantum land law within the greater context of the of loss of sovereignty and colonization that took place um, in the late night in the early 1900s that led to American Samoa becoming a US territory of the United States, then we begin to understand that this law was actually designed in order to protect 
American Samoans and their ability to continue to hold on to their land. A small island nation such as American Samoa and their people could easily lose land to non-Samoans and could therefore further perpetuate the loss of support the, the loss of sovereignty and the racial subordination because of the colonization that took place. In sum, both uh, anti-alien land laws and blood quantum laws, in my view, help us to better understand just how complex the use of race, uh, race as a technology for racial subordination and property law, but also as a possible tool for um, a form of reparation in ensuring that some indigenous peoples continue to hold on to their, uh, to their lands and the connections between land and their way of life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank you. Um, I just want to take two, two, a minute to just um, introduce two of our most active participants in the chat. Um, one of whom I just had the pleasure of meeting myself. I reached out to introduce myself. Um, and so we have uh, Professor Jade Craig, who is uh, joining this semester um, the faculty at Nova Southeastern University School of Law and teaching property and real estate transactions. So um, thank you very much for joining us, Jade, and, and for your, your contributions. And also Professor Andrea Boyack, uh, who teaches property real estate transactions, commercial business transactions at Washburn University School of Law. And so she's been um, she's been a little active on the chat as well. And then to my colleague, Irina Mansa, who teaches intellectual property here at Hofstra, who, who has chimed in a bit. So thank you all. And um, you know, if you if you have anything to add, I would, you know, love, love to hear it. Um, but I do want to um, start the discussion off uh, with the the um, you know, maybe the low hanging fruit, which is when you put together a panel like this one or any, um, any you know, conference that deals with race, um, you run the risk of being kind of dismissed or um, just kind of labeled critical race theory and um, an entire, you know, segment of the population has some very um, set ideas about what that means. And so I want to kind of open it up um, to the panel and maybe starting with Kaylee about um, what is critical race theory? Um, when is it, you know, when is it appropriate? When, when are there other tools that we can use that might be um, more appropriate? And if you can just kind of help us understand that. Thank you so much for um, the, the question. So I, I want to be really careful talking about critical race theory because I think it's important to understand um, the basic premises of critical race theory and how it differs from other types of scholarship related to race. So critical race theory makes three basic claims. First, that racism in American and indeed broadly Western law, um, that racism is endemic within legal institutions and legal structures. Second, that this racism undermines the legal rationality of the law or assumptions about the legal rationality of the law. And three, that because of this, we need a liberated interdisciplinary scholarly method that can address the persistence of racism. And so the method that is most commonly associated with the critical race theory movement is the use of narrative to interrogate um, legal rationality. And when I say narrative, I mean a constructive narrative using an individual or a group of individuals um, and their stories about the law, right? Um, uh, to uh, or a legal issue um, to interrogate this. Now, this is distinct from the case study method, which uses cases, right? So the key methodological choice of critical race theory is the use of a constructive narrative to understand legal issues. So when we talk about CRT as a broad umbrella to talk about race, we are making a fundamental categorical mistake, right? We're, 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 we're saying that talking about race is talking about critical race theory. But critical race theory has its own specific methodologies that I think are important to understanding how it functions within the legal academy. And so when we say, oh, well, we're going to get rid of critical race in schools, it's, again, fundamentally a categorical mistake. So how, how, how can I contrast that? So I study race, but I 
have come to studying race from history. I was a history major at Johns Hopkins and I received my master's in history. And when we, um, Al Brophy and I, in our first edition of Integrating Space, um, Integrating Spaces designed the textbook, we designed it as historians, right? So we, instead of looking and using a constructive narrative, we actually studied the development of and the use of uh, cases over time in a chronological fashion, right? And we brought in interdisciplinary perspectives um, from history, right? It, that approach is typically called a social legal construction of race, right? In that sense, we use and think about the racial subject in the law in a slightly distinct fashion from critical race theory. We understand it as a resource in understanding the theoretical development of the law, as a basis for understanding how the law functions, and as often as a basis for the construction of empirical models. We are doing something very differently when we study race. And so one of the real problems, right, to the extent that we have what I call boogeyman CRT, right, because it sounds fun and also um, it's true, uh, it, is that we are not understanding how it works as its own discipline, right? And I think that is one, of, and, and then that makes it easier, for instance, to use the boogeyman of CRT to sort of enact censorship models in, in speech and in the law. Thank you. Um, do any of the other uh, panelists want to? Yeah, Bethany. So, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that uh, Professor Murray just said. I one aspect of critical race theory that I think has also been misunderstood is that in a lot of critical race theory works, um, it tries to get us away from the idea that bad things happen because individuals are racist, that racism is based in individual intent um, and says, this is the way the system is set up and race deeply influenced it. Um, and so we should look at the system as a whole, both where it came from as historians do and what it means to the people and these institutions caught in that system. Um, and what's been so puzzling, to, so I mean, although I don't use narrative, I do think somebody could say that my work is, you know, in its, now it it uses critical race theory um because it looks at the systems and how they influence things um today um and but it's so puzzling that people look at that and say that's attacking me because it's the opposite of attacking me it's saying no it's not because you individually are being racist and saying, this is the system we all live in. This is the water, we're all swimming in it. But anyway. Yes, thank you. Um, Joe or, oh yeah, Rose, go ahead. And then Joe. <laughs> oh, um, this is where, where I'm glad that you, you mentioned Joe too, because so as a property professor and I use Joe and Bethany's book, um, I found it and they use critical race theory and, and highlight racism and race in, in virtually all subjects in property law. As a, when I started teaching, the, it, it was easy for me to talk about race. Well, I shouldn't say it's easy. It's not easy to talk about race, but I had the materials there that my students can look at. And so it didn't become an extra thing that I had to bring into the classroom. It wasn't, here's, let's take a look at critical race theory in, um, in, in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It was just already there. And so I think what's important to, for me anyway, in the way that I teach property law is that it's just, we ought to recognize that racism was every part of the foundation of property law. It's not, we don't need to, we shouldn't have to say, hey, let's look at this extra lens of pedagogical or research tool nor in order to better understand. We need to accept that racism was key to property law. Thank you. I wanna say also, <clears throat> there's a kind of oddity to, um, the politicization of this as a kind of um, issue in, uh, you know, Republican Democratic debates and schools and that kind of thing and state legislatures, um, it sort of misunderstands how scholarship works and how academia works. 
there's no such thing as critical race theory. There are really great scholars who um, invented that terminology um, and use it as an overhanging um, idea for the kind of work that they're doing. But each of the scholars does it differently. There, there's, there's a lot of diversity among people who do critical race theory. The same way there is for, you know, we can talk about law and economics. There are some basic things that are common, but there's lots of differences about how people use economic analysis uh, in law. And even just traditional um, analysis of cases, you know, just we have lots of different ways to think about that. So there's actually a huge amount of interesting diversity among the people who do critical race theory. There's not like a single simple method that you can, you know, uh, just point to. There's a lot of diversity. Um, and, you know, the, whatever people think about it, um, it uh, to me, the baseline thing is exactly what Kaylee said, which is to um, don't act as if race is not an important issue when you're thinking about things which are inextricably linked to race, right? It's sort of like um, uh, uh, um, just trying to keep things separate when there is an absolute link between them uh, is actually um, just basically telling yourself, don't look at reality, don't look at truth, uh, don't face facts. Um, <clears throat> there's no way to actually understand current American law or historical American law or current social relationships or economics without looking at the role race has played in the US history and the role that the legal system has had in actually perpetuating and creating racial disparities. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the, I'd emphasize, you know, something that Bethany said, which is that the focus is not what people seem to think it is. It's the focus is not telling everybody that they were racist. The focus is trying to figure out what are the structures that we have created, both in the legal system and the political system and in construction of social relationships, the way we view each other, what are all the systems that are in place that actually perpetuate racial inequalities? Um, intentional, motivated racial discrimination is certainly part of this. It's, it's not like we're over that, but I think one of the major emphases of critical race theory is to figure out how, even if people are well-intentioned, um, they may not be aware that their current structures, which are created by human beings, they're not laws of nature, they're created by human beings, they can be changed. And to see actually what those structures are and how they have racially disparate impacts is a crucial thing to think about if you care about racial justice. Um, and to sort of say, well, that's critical race theory, so you shouldn't do it. You know, that's like saying, well, you're not allowed to talk about race and to talk to teach property law without talking about race to me is telling me I cannot teach property law. Thank, thank you, Joe. And actually, maybe I can just follow up on that a little bit to, and, and to, to, to ask. Um, we, we are all property law professors and property law scholars, um, but race plays a role in, you know, many other, I mean, you've talked about civil rights law, but there's many other areas of law where race is, is, is sort of foundational, it, you know, and so, and, you know, Kaylee talked about intellectual property law. What are some of the other areas of the law school curriculum um, that you think would, I don't know, benefit or just um, where it would be appropriate for us to more explicitly recognize race? Kelly, why don't you go? Okay. okay, so I think environmental law, obviously the history of um, thinking around environmental issues, um, we now have an explicit address. We can explicitly address it through environmental justice and the dialogue around environmental justice. But I think there are ways in which, um, and I think the Bethany's 
mentioning of waste and wastelands, right? And thinking about how um, our understanding of land itself is situated in race um, and, and, and situated in choices we made to make it race, I think is a really important part of thinking through environmental law. And, and, and I always try to, I think people, when people say, oh, well, we don't understand how critical race theory works or how thinking about race works, I always point them to the term branding, right? So like when you say I brand myself, right? Like what does it mean as a society that we treat in trademark law branding as if it wasn't uh, a part of an enslaved person's experience to be branded? And that we use words in American society where we don't even understand the meaning of those terms, but they're heavily racialized. They're, they're bought in heavily racialized ways. So even thinking about, for instance, business association or, or corporations, classes where people don't think that are about race. When you look at the history of business associations in this country, some of the earliest entity property um, were entity property organizations that were used to trade in slaves, right? Um, and we think about the corporate form and the charter form in English history, early chartered corporations were corporations that were chartered to engage in the slave trade. So we, like, I, I, I don't, like, I think I can literally walk through every course in the law school curriculum and be like, okay, let's talk about race here. Okay, let's talk about race here. And I think one of the things, and this is where, um, I miss Sue, is I don't think Americans actually understand how much modern development was it, it intertwined with slavery as a form of capitalism. And the, the forms that we have and the ways in which, including law, that we think about things that we never ever think about as being about slavery that are deeply intertwined with slavery and we don't even think about it. It's the language that we speak. We don't understand I think, and we haven't really begun to grapple with the consequences of enslavement and dispossession in the society of territoriality, right, in the society. And so like, we just sort of casually walk around with people's ghosts and we don't understand that, I think, in the law. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add? Yeah, Bethany. Yeah, just let me add another one, family law. Um, so as those of us who teach property know, family property is all organized around um, marriage. And uh, this is something that's new in the current edition of the uh, Singer casebook. Um, uh, and so we've had a lot of focus on the gender implications of that and more recently the LGBTQ implications of that. Um, but one thing that we haven't focused on enough is um, both the racial um, and the economic implications of that, that marriage increasingly is something that, well, so marriage historically was something that was accessible on very racially unequal terms. Um, and today um, is something that's increasingly accessible more to people um, of particular economic groups um, is less accessible um, for uh, lower income people of color and so on. So to the extent that we organize property coming from family relationships around marriage, that has big racial impacts that we need to think about. Thank you. Rose? I put in the chat this case book by uh, Professor Dorothy Brown. I once used it when I taught critical race theory and uh, she walks us through different cases in each of the 1L class, civil procedure, towards contracts. Um, I enjoyed using that book. I didn't enjoy learning all the different subjects in one semester, that was quite challenging. But from a student's perspective, that case book is one that's useful for understanding how else one can talk about or understand race in the various 1L curriculum. I teach immigration law and also citizenship law and uh, both areas of law um, have roots in uh, racism is is rooted in the development of those two areas of law. Definitely. I mean, I do think that every single law school topic, if you actually try to think about it and, you know, you can talk to, Kelly talked about being an historian. If you talk to historians or people that are practitioners in the field or, you know, part of the critical race theory idea is to talk to actually non-lawyers uh, about their experiences. Um, 
uh, you know, you can see race connected with almost any class. Uh, I teach conflict of laws, which is, you know, a subject that most students do not take, which is seen as kind of procedure and kind of, it's difficult because there's no easy answer when, when an event touches two different states and both states have reasons to apply their law. They're just, there's no easy answer. It's just a hard thing. And um, uh, it's a pervasive sort of issue. Um, but as I said, I just published a textbook um, that includes conflicts between tribal law and state law. And it's the first book ever to do that, again, because federal Indian law is complicated. But I also just talked with my students um, just yesterday about the conflict of laws issues um, in the era of slavery. There are two major books, one by Robert Cover and one by Paul Finkelman that are just really amazing pieces of historical scholarship um, about uh, you know, what happens if someone who's enslaved goes into um, Massachusetts, are they immediately free because it's a free state? Uh, that's what the law was in England after Somerset's case. And just as soon as you stepped onto English soil, you became free. Um, and there were some Northern states that used that a little bit some of the time, but not always. And there's a history of how um, uh, your status as being slave or free changed over time. And there were different accommodations over time. Um, and uh, that, um, you know, you, you might not think that conflicts would be related to race, but th that it really was in that era. And I did a hypothetical with my class about if uh, Roe versus Wade is overturned um, and someone from Texas comes to Massachusetts to get an abortion and goes back to Texas, if the Texas legislature authorizes a third person to bring a lawsuit on behalf of the unborn child, what law applies, Texas law or Massachusetts law? And there, you know, that seems like, well, that's not a racial issue, but of course it is a racial issue because black women will have fewer resources than white women to be able to go out of Texas to get an abortion. Um, and so, you know, again, almost any class, if you're actually think through uh, sociology or history um, or people's personal experiences, um, you would see race being related to local government law, uh, to bankruptcy, uh, to family law, as we've said, to corporate law, um, even to federal courts. Uh, what cases get into federal courts? What are the remedies? Um, just almost any course that's in an upper level um, uh, curriculum, if you look for it, you can find it. And this is actually one recommendation I have for students. Um, students have the power to do um, work in terms of doing research, finding professors that are allies of theirs. Um, you can do work to figure out the racial issues in the classes that you're teaching. If you actually were to do work to sort of come up with, here's something I didn't learn in the class, but I wish I had learned. If you, you can actually create teaching materials uh, that you can give to your teachers. And the teachers that want to do this will be grateful for you are making it possible for them to do it. They may just not have been aware of the issue. So I do think students actually can imagine helping reform the curriculum by actually you know, being activists um, and actually you know, themselves saying, you may not have been aware of this, but here it is. I think this is something you could spend a class doing in your bankruptcy class and the students would find it fascinating and they'd think you're a good teacher if you did it. Yeah, I, I just wanna to add to that. One of the things that we, we've talked about, the panel has talked about is um, how important it is to have the teaching materials available for um, law professors because putting the material together is an enormous amount of work. It's time consuming and especially if it's an area that you don't have a real expertise in. Um, and so, you know, one of the one of the things that Joe's property case book 
did for so many of us was to give us a, a resource, a legitimate sort of here it is. I don't have to add it in. I don't have to, I don't have to, it doesn't look like I'm making a big deal about race because it's just part of the curriculum. It's just part of it. And so, you know, Joe answered this, you know, more specifically, but, you know, in terms of what can law students do? So if you're sitting here and law professors and you're thinking, okay, I, I just took trust in the states and we didn't talk about it, or I just took conflicts of law and no one ever mentioned it. How can I find a way to integrate this into the curriculum? Um, you know, Joe's suggestion about students as advocates, um, you're, you know, you, you can make a difference. And just to open that up to, to anyone else in terms of advice for law students about how to change things or you know, um, preparing materials, things like that. Can I, can I say, Shira, um, another idea, this is both for students and for faculty, including young faculty. Um, uh, I mean, Bethy and I have a case book together and we get suggestions from people about changes to make, and we've made suggest we've made changes based on those suggestions. So just think about the casebook authors as human beings, and not just as you know books that are not changeable. Uh, young professors and students can actually have an impact on those books by saying, "Here's something I think that you maybe didn't know about. Um, my book was changed after." Rose wrote her article about the Oyama case. We incorporated her insights um, into the um, book. Um, and I wouldn't have known to do that without the work that she did. Um, and I also would encourage young teachers to actually think about producing um, teaching materials. It's easier now than it was in the generation before me because you can look up cases and statutes on Lexus and Westlaw. Um, and, uh, you know, it is once you get tenure, um, most law schools wrongly don't consider casebooks to help toward getting tenure. I think that's wrong. I think they should count that as scholarship. But um, to the extent that you have tenure, um, writing a casebook is liberating for a professor because you can actually reimagine the field. You can write the notes, you can choose the cases, you can choose the context. Um, and young professors, I think, should feel empowered to actually um, uh, you know, connect with existing casebook authors, but also to think about writing their own teaching materials. I, this is something that I would encourage young people to do. I've long thought that we do not have a good book in contracts which adequately addresses racial issues. I've been trying for a long time to get some young professor to write a new contracts case book that adequately addresses employment discrimination, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and a bunch of other issues. Thank you. And I, maybe I could broaden it and I rose, um, maybe we could broaden the discussion a little bit. I don't want to imply that the onus is on um, law students, only that you do have some power, but the onus is on all of us. So, you know, what are other suggestions for faculty and administrators and really just everybody involved? Rose. Yes. Yeah, so um, what me, I can talk about the, some of the work that we've done at Rutgers Law School. Um, in June 2020, the faculty passed a faculty resolution in support of Black Lives Matter and committing ourselves to become an anti-racist establishment institution. And that meant for us engaging in hard work, different types of work, including reviewing our curriculum. And, and so we formed a committee to look at our curriculum and it's an ongoing project to see how is race being discussed in the classroom? What are the resources that are needed in order to, uh, to make that effective implement what it means to be an anti-racist law school. There, I have colleagues who want to talk about race, who want to address it, but they don't feel that they have the tools or the experience, um, whether that's correct or not, because I see all of us are experienced race in different ways and could talk about it. The goal, the point is that there are some who, who want to, but they were reluctant. And so as an institution, we decided to use our resources to 
provide workshops and trainings for faculty and administrators on exclusion, on, on how to have, to have an inclusive environment to, in the classroom, in our offices when we're talking to students. Um, how, what does what are some materials that we should consider including in our in our teaching and our syllabus and just to broaden conversations of um, our of law beyond the conventional understanding as they're framed in case books. So I think it, it requires, of course, student power is crucial here buy in from faculty, but administrators have um, can devote resources. Into, um, in, into ensuring that as an institution, these systemic changes happen so that um, it, it can continue and help to change the way that we are teaching the law. Um, one of the other two additional changes that we made that I'm really proud of is that we have required our students to take an equity class before they graduate. And um, that's hard. It, that's not easy to do. It was not an easy discussion, but we made it work, and um, and it, we're in the process of impl implementing what that looks like. And then we also created a pilot project on law and inequality for our one Ls. It's an elective that they can take, and so I'm teaching law and inequality and immigration and races, uh, immigration and citizenship. So these the, those uh, the pilot project was faculty led. And, um, and and so that's that shows also the work the faculty can do in or in, in trying to be much more engaged in understanding racism and the law. Thank you. Does anyone want to add about yeah, Kat, Kaylee? I always challenge students too. I ask them. I, I, I challenge them two ways, and Arena would like this. I think we law schools typically don't ask whether or not the teacher effectively taught diversity, equity, or inclusion in the course in the course evaluations, right? Um, and and, I, and I, I put it there for two reasons. Teaching race for me as a African-American woman was incredibly difficult and I received um, significantly um, hostile to student evaluations. Um, and, uh, and I always try to describe what that meant, right? So I was the youngest person in my building and I was teaching property and race and I was the only person teaching property and race, which is why I think Rose's idea that this has to be a cultural shift at the institutional level is so important. But I also ask students to look at their own biases as to who they think and what they think should be taught in law school. Um, a lot of students come in with very considerable biases about what they think a law school class should look like and what they think a law school class should act like. And I always challenge students to say, you know, sometimes we're not teaching race because um, we've received really bad evaluations for it. And although we're a nationally recognized professor on these issues, we wanna get tenure. Um, and so when we talk about the incentives for younger professors, particularly in women and disabled professors teaching from these types of texts, I think law school students have to have an internal set of questions they have to ask themselves. Are they actually willing to accept and to think about the set of issues as something they think law school should be about? And typically what I ask students to do before they come to law school, I ask them to read Becoming Gentlemen by Lonnie Guineer um, because we tell students to read One Owl by Scott Turow. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's really accurate anymore. But more importantly, Becoming Gentlemen questions the law school curriculum and really helpful and sustaining ways about what we do in law school and classrooms and should we as professors be doing them and should we as students be accepting that set of choices and so I think part of what you have to ask yourselves of students is do I want to hear this material from the person that is delivering the material and then ask yourself very fundamentally why that is a potentially a problem for you because it's very often a problem for institutions. Thank you. Yes, Bethany. I, I want to completely co-sign what Professor Murray just said. Um, I think it is a very different thing creating your own materials. I, so I've got a colleague who is a white Irish looking man. He gets amazing teaching evaluations. I just learned that he starts all his classes with a discussion of Freddie Gray, who was killed by the police in Baltimore and how Baltimore's racialized zoning choices, health choices, everything completely shaped that interaction. I'm the one that gets dinged for being too political on my teaching evaluations. Um, 
And particularly when I brought in my own materials, now that I am the author of the case book, sometimes I get what recently there were a cluster of students who were like, yeah, we know you wrote the case book. Um, I did not appreciate even that, <laughs> but, um, but I don't get dinged for anymore because the case book makes it look like that's what's supposed to be in there. But there, so as students, you need to support your professors that are trying to bring different perspectives into the classroom and as administrators you need to recognize the costs of that to some of your faculty members um, and Irina posted in the chat the amazing thing that she helped to create about teaching evaluations and their role and Thank you. I need to leave because I so because I I had to reschedule a dentist appointment to be here but thank you all so much Thank you, Bethany. And 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 yes, we, we are almost out of time, which, um, you know, I wish we weren't. I wish we could continue this discussion. And I hope that we will um, uh, offline in all sorts of other forums. So many of you have posted resources in the chat. And I know that our panelists are all deeply committed to this um, topic and, you know, would be open to additional discussions. Um, so I just want to ask if there's any kind of final remarks that anyone wants to make to send us off. Okay, well then in that case, thank you so much for your time um, and for, for being here and thank you to all the participants. Um, this was wonderful and I hope we can do a follow-up program um, at some point in the future. Have a good day, everybody. Bye, thank you, Ashira. Bye.